Okay. Um, so sorry for missing a bit of the first one. So if I, if I haven't met you, I'm Nick Luson. I'm a club services coordinator for NorCal. Um, thanks for coming out. So part of our objective is to keep doing more around the development of our member clubs in the off the field areas. I think NorCal's gained a very good reputation for our coach education side of things. And we put a lot of resources and time and energy into raising the bar and coaching. And over the past couple of years, we've realized like that's been good and very effective, but we also need to really help raise the bar now for people actually running soccer clubs, you know, and doing the off field aspects, which can be huge. And realistically, the story for a lot of us running a soccer club is that you came into it as a coach in one direction, possibly. So maybe you're a coach and you did a good job as a coach and somebody was like, hey, let's make you a director of coaching. You're like, yeah, cool, sure. And now you're suddenly a director of coaching, but that's a totally different job. You know, and so you're kind of figuring out as you go. Or you came in the other way where you were a parent in a club and somebody like twisted your arm and all of a sudden you're on a board and all of a sudden now you're in charge of something and then like, hey, let's just make you the president. And you're like, cool, now I'm running a nonprofit organization and I never got any training in doing that either. And so you just kind of figure it out as you go. So our hope is to arm all of you with more skills and abilities. Um, we want to help you achieve your goals as soccer clubs. And so we're trying to bring in a series of uh, different speakers and presenters bring a good variety in all of the different areas of running a club. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this next one because this is going in a different direction. Uh, most of our presenters have always been, uh, you know, here's soccer specific people. So I thought it'd be interesting to bring somebody from academia. So uh, introduction, uh, Professor Michael Goldman is an associate professor in the sport management program at the University of San Francisco. He teaches sport marketing and business development and sales on both campuses. Through his teaching, research, and consulting activities in the business of sport, Michael has worked with leading soccer, rugby, and cricket sponsors, right holders, broadcasters, and agencies in South Africa and Kenya. As a senior lecturer in marketing at the University of Pretoria's Gordon Institute of Business Science since 2005, Michael designed, delivered, and assessed postgraduate management courses on a number of academic and executive programs to managers from a wide range of companies, including Pepsi, SAB Miller, Africa, and Asia, Nokia, Africa, Barclays, and Sassel. He's a regular media contributor on sport marketing issues and is published academically in the US, Europe, and Africa. So warm welcome to Professor Goldman. Thanks very much. All right, so should we talk soccer? Football. Yeah, we up, we up on football? Cool, football it is, sounds good. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much for coming through. And what I thought might be interesting is to spend the next half an hour, 40 minutes, I want to share some thoughts with you about what I'm seeing in the space, uh, specifically around uh, player acquisition, right, around customer acquisition, around fan acquisition. Uh, what are some of those opportunities to do that a little bit better, to think about what are some of our strategies and some of the choices that we're making, and then get into a conversation about that. So we've got a, quite a bit of time to have some, some conversation, some Q&A, but if you want to stop me any time, over the next uh, little while, please do. Uh, these slides also, Nick, Nick will have these slides and they'll be available on your website. Uh, so uh, please feel free to use them and abuse them uh, as you want afterwards. Sound good? Okay. So we've seen that this youth sport space has exploded. You may have seen this Time article a year or so ago, right? $15 billion. That's what they say <laughs> is hanging out in the youth sport sector. Yeah, you guys seeing $15 billion? Yeah, uh, so it's somewhere, <laughs> it's somewhere, right, $15 billion, uh, and uh, a big focus on pay-to-play, right, which I know you guys have spoken quite a bit about, and the opportunities for everyone to have an opportunity to kick a ball, um, but there's this massive push, as you can see there, uh, perhaps overspending in certain areas, uh, and uh, the parents who are prepared to spend whatever they, they can whatever they need to, in order to support their darling daughter or darling son, yeah? Uh, and so that's the context we're in. At the same time, as we see these big numbers, and we see front page Time Magazine articles about this, at the same time, if we look at the numbers, we're going the wrong way, right? So as we head towards now, those are our major sports here in the US, right? Uh, and we are the gray one over there. So basketball is still kind of holding, 
But I can tell you that girls basketball, for example, are having very serious conversations right now about uh, at an NBA level about how to get girls playing, how to get young women uh, playing basketball because volleyball is eating their lunch. So a number of sports are now experiencing the same kinds of issues, right? And we're seeing uh, a substantial drop-off in participation. Yes. spent by kids, right? So theoretically, a couple reasons could be that maybe kids are specialized or they need to go at a younger age or dropping out of soccer to play basketball. Sure. You're absolutely right, and part of what that Time article spoke about was this, this focus on specialization, uh, and the science suggests it's way too early. Right, and, and so we want kids to be playing, we want young people uh, to be playing as many sports as possible, right? Multi-sport from a sports science point of view, uh, from a maturity point of view, from a fitness point of view. Um, so, so yes, I think that is partly, could be playing into this, this space as, as children are selecting options, but they're also doing non-sport things, right? What are young people doing, right? They're playing, but not the kind of playing that we are used to, right? And so the gaming, uh, eSport, for example, um, is now a top three participation activity in most markets. Right? It's come out of nowhere. It feels like it's come out of nowhere, right? Elon Musk and others remind us that they were playing games in the 60s and 70s, uh, but it feels like it's come out of nowhere. Uh, and so, you know, one of the interesting points, I think, for us to talk about if we're out there trying to get more players is what's the competitive landscape? And, and this is partly your competitive landscape, but it's also not your competitive landscape. It's every other thing they do for every other hour in a week. That's your competitive landscape. Yeah? So this is a starting point, but we've we got to get to the, to the bigger one. And so three things I want to talk about this afternoon that I hope will be useful as you think a little bit about your strategy. Uh, firstly, we, we've got to talk about who. And so if we're trying to, to attract more players, what do we know about those prospective players? How much do we know about those prospective players? How much do we know about the communities they live in? How much do we know about their parents? How much do we know about the schools that they go to? How much do we know about the other things they do in those many hours in the week that they are not spending time with us. Yeah? So we want to spend a little bit of time talking about the who and segmentation and audiences, and we're going to answer those three questions as we, we spend some time this afternoon. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about the why, because basic psychology and sociology tells us that no one's going to do stuff just because we want them to. They're going to do stuff because they're motivated to do it, because it meets a specific human need. And I want to share with you some research around what are the main sport participation motives that we can tap into. And many of those are probably part of your marketing materials right now. And I want to check that with you. But I also want to share with you some other motives, some human drivers, some needs. Right? Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the stuff that gets people out of bed in the morning. And we may not be the stuff that gets people out of bed in the morning. So what can we attach ourselves to to get people out of the beds in the morning and come to us? Yeah, so what are those needs? What are those motives? No one's going to do nothing. <laughs> no one's going to do anything yeah, unless we've triggered a need. We don't create needs. We trigger needs. We surface needs. We identify needs. We better be 100% on what the needs are of the prospective players that we're looking to attract. And soccer may not be at the top of that list. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about some of the tactics around communications. Right? Um, how are we getting the message out? If we know who we're targeting and we know what we want to be saying and what the needs are, what the motives are that are going to get those people out of bed, that is going to trigger some kind of activity, some kind of participation, then how do we get that message in front of them? On their games, yeah? on their PlayStations, their PCs, etc. Uh, on their screens, their multiple screen environments. Yeah, at schools, in community areas. Uh, how do we get the message in front of them? So I want to spend some time just talking a little bit about that. Cool. So that's a bit of the agenda, and we can return to that as we go. So that's a picture of some six-year-olds. <laughs> uh, what do we know about them? What are the things that come to mind when you think about six? You guys work with six-year-olds? Yeah? Just kind of in the ballpark? 
What do we know about six-year-olds? They, they like to have fun. Cool. How do they define fun? Games. Fun little games. Not necessarily organized, not necessarily structured. Just some kind of game that does what? What makes it enjoyable? Cool. Social. Yeah, so they like to be social. They like to have play dates. <laughs> they like to hang out with other kids. Uh, my son joined a, a, a club team uh, here in the Bay Area, um, and it didn't last so long because he couldn't connect with the kids. It doesn't matter what was happening on the field. Yeah, it doesn't matter if they were winning or losing. He didn't feel like they were his buddies. He went to find some other people who could be his buddies. So, so social is part of that, right? So games, they like to play. They like to be social. What else do we know about six-year-olds? Yeah. Right, so attention spans, yeah, and, and how long can we really keep them going, and how do, we, uh, how, how do we tap into that energy that's quite fleeting? Yeah, they're up and they're down and they're all over the place, and then they're doing nothing. <laughs> um, do we know enough about the six-year-olds that you're trying to target? Do you have a six-year-old plan, a plan for six-year-olds? Six-year-olds can be selfish, sure, uh, like all of us. They, they care about what's important to them. Sure, sure. And, and so it is, it is a very personal, it is about, about them, yeah? So do you have a plan to attract six-year-olds? What does your six-year-old attraction plan look like? Attract the parents. Okay, so partly it's through the parents. And so influences, reference groups, that's really important. Right? And so if we put the six-year-old in the middle, if we put these guys in the middle, and we'll say, well, what's around them? Yeah, it's the influences, it's the reference groups, it's the parents, it's the teachers, it's other sport coaches, it's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, all the other activities that they're involved in. Right? Those are some of the influences and reference groups that matter. Yeah? But essentially, my point this afternoon is we've got to have a plan if you want more six-year-olds, what's your six-year-old plan? And the core of your six-year-old plan is what do they care about? Are we giving them what they care about? Do we know where they hang out? Do we know how to reach them? Because if we don't know how to reach them, then we're just kind of spraying and praying. Right? Spray and pray. It's, it's a shotgun approach. We just throw the message out there as far and wide and hope it sticks. Well, that's a 50-50 chance. We want to have a slightly better chance than a 50-50 chance. Yeah, so we want to build a plan that's based on understanding this in a little bit more detail. Here's some information uh, from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Anybody been there recently? No. The U.S. <laughs> the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is what they say adolescents spend their time doing. So we're now jumping from six-year-olds to, what, 16-year-olds? What's adolescent? 14, 15, 16? Depends how they behave, right? So what are adolescents doing? This is how much time they're spending weekdays and weekends. Any surprises here? What do you think of these numbers? So how, much are they, how much time are they spending doing our stuff? So it's 0.7 hours a day during the week, almost an, an hour on the weekend, average for all adolescents yeah, in the US. Leisure, a little bit more. Not a lot of time eating. I don't, I don't, I don't know why they're not eating. <laughs> a lot of time for us? No. Yeah? So this is part of your competition. How do you position yourself relative to every hour, every other hour, that that person is spending in a typical day or week or weekend? Yeah? Where does your role fit in? How do you connect your offering, right? their involvement, their participation in your club, how do you connect that to the other parts of their week and weekend? Or is that only when they're on the field? Is that only when they come to you? 
Because if it's only when they come to you, it's less than an hour. That's not a lot of time. How do you connect with the rest of this? Yeah? Again, it's about understanding in a slightly deeper way who they are. These numbers are a little bit small. Let me dive in here uh, and give you a sense. So this is looking at 15-year-olds and over. Uh, and what are they spending their time? Hours per day. So all leisure and sports activities yeah, is just over five hours. Yeah, 15 years and over. So that's all of us. Yeah. Watching TV kind of captures a lot. This was 2017. I suspect we'll see the shift over time. We'll be watching content. It just won't necessarily be on TV, right? Uh, playing games. Computer use for leisure, excluding games. And then right down here, sport, exercise, recreation. Okay? So understand as we build a marketing plan that says, come and spend time with us. Come and participate with us. Yeah? This is the context in which you need to convince someone to invest some time. Because they have very other alternate yeah, competition for their time. Clayton Christensen, who we'll hear from in a moment, he's a prophet Harvard, um, and he talks about a number of really interesting concepts. One of them is non-consumption. And his argument here is that you can go to where everyone's fishing and where the fish are, right? You can go and find out where people are who are playing sport, who are playing soccer, and you can steal them from other people. That's one strategy, right? Uh, and that may be part of your plan, right? It's a more of a competitive, I'm going to go steal some people. Right, from other clubs, from other sport or soccer playing environments. But the other way to think about this is what about non-consumption? Right? So who's not playing? Who's not playing soccer? Who's not playing anything? Those numbers are a little bit scary if you think at a macro societal level. Uh, 80 million people. So 80 million Americans are not participating in any kind of sport or recreational activity. This is from the Physical Activity Council, uh, their numbers from last year, uh, almost 30%. What's interesting about this is those who are between the ages of 6 and 12 who are inactive. The number one thing that they're interested in doing is soccer. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So there's 80 million people out there in the US, and certainly those between the ages of 6 and 12 are really interested in doing soccer. But they haven't found a way yet to do that. So there's this untapped demand. Yeah. You said that, that, so that list below, I'm sorry, David. Yeah. Does that, that from the inactive? Yeah. Those are, so that's the kids that are inactive yeah. reporting the things that they'd like to do for their time. Yeah, those who are inactive between the ages of 6 to 12 the number one thing they're most interested to do, if they were to get active, was soccer. What, what's the time that they spend on soccer? Uh, they had a certain number of hours in a week. I, I can't remember what it is, uh, but it would be a really small. Yeah, they're doing nothing. These are the couch potatoes, the gamers. Yeah, although I think that's even counted as a sport. So I think you could take gaming out of it, right? So the couch potatoes to get them off the couch to get them to come and participate, well, we have an interesting opportunity here. That opportunity disappears here. So once you hit 12, we disappear off that list. You don't see soccer anywhere else. So we have an opportunity between the age of 6 and 12 with the inactives, with almost 30% of American population who is not doing something. Yeah. So there's an interesting opportunity there as you think about segmentation. So really what the point I want to make here around understanding who we're targeting is it's about segmentation. It's about different segments, right? As you think about an orange or whatever kind of fruit you consume, uh, it's about different segments. And we're not looking at six-year-olds. We're not looking at youth as one thing. Yeah, there are different groups. There are different types. People who are looking for, for different needs. Right? And so part of a plan to attract six-year-olds or a plan to attract new players, whatever the age group or, or category it might be, has got to be a differentiated plan. We've got to have different plans for different groups of people depending on what they want. Right? We can't have a one-size-fits-all. Think about you as a consumer. Do you buy the same stuff your neighbor does? You're in the same zip code. You may be the same age, you may have the same number of kids, you may drive the same car. Do you buy the same stuff? 
you buy it for the same reason? No, we're all different. Yeah? But from a marketing point of view, sometimes we look at segmentation like this, we look at an age cohort and we say, well, they're all the same. No, they're not. Part of how they differ is what they're looking for. What are those needs? So I want to play you a short clip from Clayton Christensen. Uh, he recorded this a few years ago where he talks a little bit about this issue of how do we understand what that underlying need is? Why do human beings do what they do? And how can we take that and think about how we unlock, trigger yeah, those needs for the kind of people we're trying to attract? We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. So I wanted just to tell you a story about a project we did for one of the big fast food restaurants. They were trying to goose up the sales of their milkshakes. They had just studied this problem up the gazoo. They brought in customers who fit the profile of the quintessential milkshake consumer. And they'd give them samples and ask, could you tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you'd buy more of them? Do you want it chocolatey or cheaper, chunky or chewier? They get very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions, and it had no impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question on his mind, and that was, I wonder what job arises in people's lives that caused them to come to this restaurant to hire a milkshake. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day and just took very careful data what time did they buy these milkshakes? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or drive off with it? It turned out that nearly half of the milkshakes were sold before 8 o'clock in the morning. The people who bought them were always alone. It was the only thing they bought, and they all got in the car and drove off with it. So to figure out what job they were trying to hire it to do, we came back the next day and stood outside the restaurant so we could confront these folks as they left milkshake in hand. And in language that they could understand, we essentially asked, excuse me please, but I gotta sort this puzzle out. What job were you trying to do for yourself that caused you to come here and hire that milkshake? And they'd struggle to answer, so we'd then help them by asking other questions like, well think about the last time you were in the same situation needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake, what did you hire? And then as we put all of their answers together, it became clear that they all had the same job to do in the morning, and that is they had a long and boring drive to work. And they just needed something to do while they drove to keep the commute interesting. One hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody had given them another hand and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do while they drove. They weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock, so they also wanted something that would just pull down there and stay for their morning. Good question. What do I hire when I do this job? You know, I've never framed the question that way before, but last Friday I hired a banana to do the job. Take my word for it, never hire bananas. They're gone in three minutes, you're hungry by 7.30. If you promise not to tell my wife, I probably hire donuts twice a week, but they don't do it well either. They're gone fast, they crumb all over my clothes, they get my fingers gooey. Sometimes I hire bagels, but as you know, they're so dry and tasteless. Then I have to steer the car with my knees while I'm putting jam on them, and then if the phone rings, we got a crisis. I remember I hired a Snickers bar once, but ah, I felt so guilty I've never hired Snickers again. Uh, let me tell you, when I come here and hire this milkshake, it is so viscous that it easily takes me 20 minutes to suck it up that thin little straw. Who cares what the ingredients are? I don't. All I know is I'm full all morning and it fits right here in my cup holder. Well, it turns out that the milkshake does the job better than any of the comp competitors, which in the customers' minds are not Burger King milkshakes, but it's bananas, donuts, bagels, Snickers bars, coffee, and so on. But I hope you can see how, if you understand the job, how to improve the product becomes just obvious. So what's Christensen saying? 
What's his argument? In an MBA classroom, I always have to go to the back, because there's always like dodgy people sitting at the back. Is that right? People who come in late sit at the back. Is that right? <laughs> I've lost eye contact with everyone at the back. So the hand over there, yes. What's he saying? Mm, and, and how does he think about needs? What's his phrase for needs? The job, right? What job does this product do for me? What am I hiring? What job am I hiring this product to do for me? So how could we use that in our context? What's the phrasing that would make sense in our context? What job, yeah, what job are they hiring us to do? Yeah. What job are they hiring us to do? Oh, it's childcare. Okay, that's real. Entertainment. Entertainment, entertain my child, um, give my child joy. That's one of the words on your website, right? Joy, entertainment. Teach them something. And perhaps from the previous panel, teach them some discipline, is what I heard. Right? Teach them something. Not necessarily soccer. I'm teaching some meta skills. I'm teaching some life skills. I'm interested in you know, them growing up. I can't handle it as a parent. Thank goodness. You try and sort them out, please. That's probably the most important one is uh, having them enjoy a physical activity, the physical side of it. They want their kids to be healthy. Be tired at the end of the day. Be tired. That's interesting. So it doesn't matter that they're healthy, it doesn't matter that they're fit, it matters that they come home tired so they'll fall asleep so they'll stop bugging me. These are real issues. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. 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 Channeling uh, energy constructively. Channeling energy constructively. It sounds very serious, but you're absolutely right, right? It's, it's understanding what those jobs are. Now, if we wrote those things down, the question I would ask is, how are we expressing those in our communication that targets prospective parents? what we would call in the business a value proposition. How clearly are we articulate the stuff that really matters, not the stuff that we sometimes think should matter, because it doesn't matter what we think matters. It doesn't matter why you think someone should come and play soccer. It really doesn't. If you want to attract someone, you've got to go where they are. And they are these kinds of issues from a parent point of view. What job do we think we do for the, the actual players, the young people who come and play for us? Well, I think that um, fitting into the triggers and creating kind of that status of being in a position to make a difference or, you know, have success. Yeah. Their society would have success. Cool, cool. So it's connecting, it's success, yeah. achievement, status, ego, uh, all of those kinds of things. And that's your typical participation kind of motives. Yeah, but understanding the parents are a critical, critical part of that. Yeah. So what are we seeing? Yeah, participation motives, the ones on the right. These are your eight big, your top eight sport participation motives. And certainly for older young people, right, adolescents, etc., these would be the ones that really matter. And if you have any kind of adult leagues or, or activities. Um, so what do we know? Achievement and status, physical fitness, team affiliation, spirit, friendship, Fun and excitement, competition performance, skill development, being active. We've heard these in the room, okay? And research supports these are the top eight, right? So if we're communicating with prospective players uh, or their parents and we're pushing the traditional set of participation motives, these are the ones we should be triggering. Are those in order? No. No, they're not. In different contexts, research finds that different ones are more important. Um, I don't have that research with me today, but uh, you'll, you'll typically find across different sports, there'll be ones that are slightly different across different age cohorts, gender. There are some differences, but broadly, these top eight always come to the top. Yeah. The interesting thing, I think, for me is, so what images are we using? What video material are we using? What content are we creating? that reinforces each one of these eight? Do we have a matrix somewhere in the office, somewhere in a laptop somewhere, that says, here are our top eight motives. What are the words? What are the video material? What are the images that we can use in each one of these eight 
to reinforce this kind of benefit. So we communicate more clearly that this is the job that coming and participating or playing or paying whatever will, will give for you. Yeah? It's that level of detail we need to get to as we build these plans. Yeah? So it's not one size fits all. It's not one image of that championship winning goal. That's not the image that's going to do it for every single cohort that we're trying to attract. Yeah? What specific content are we creating in each one of these? The stuff on the left is some work that was reported in the Harvard Business Review over the last few years, uh, more consumer behavior research. And the interesting thing about this is some of the words they use, and you can see it in more detail in the slide when you download it, um, but nostalgia is an interesting one if you think about parents. Now, how many of the parents that we engage with played soccer and want their darlings to do as well, if not better, than they did? Do we see that? Yeah. So nostalgia is a really interesting motive that we can trigger. And how could we trigger nostalgia among a group of parents um, in order to attract that family? Because right? it's not just attracting the young player, it's attracting the family. Yeah? So how do we tap into nostalgia? Where did those parents play? When did they play? Who did they play with? Who won the World Cup in the year that they played? Yeah? Uh, what are some of those connection points that we can make? in order to put communication out that talks directly to the stuff that they care about. Yeah, nostalgia is a really powerful uh, motive that we know. Some of the other ones here, motivation itself. Yeah? And then this interesting one around social impact is increasingly we're finding, especially the younger generation that was mentioned earlier, uh, this younger generation cares more about the planet than we, than we have, which is good. Um, and they actually care about fellow human beings, the seven billion people on the planet, a little bit more than we have in the past. Uh, so this younger generation is much more in tune with what are you doing for the broader community? And so an interesting motive, I think, to, to activate in some of the communication might be to talk about the stuff you guys do for the broader community. Where are your teams going out and cleaning up rivers? Where are your teams going out and working with kids who can't play? Where are your teams going out and working in communities that need to be fed? And so your corporate social responsibility, your charity work, your community angle that is core to any activity that you want to do, how are you able to use that in a way that doesn't just do good yeah, for the beneficiaries, but does good for the club? because it's an interesting motive <clears throat> that can then be triggered. I want my family to come and hang out with you guys and play with your club. Yes, there's some stuff that happens on the soccer field, but what I really care about is the, com the impact you're making in my community. <clears throat> and that becomes an interesting motive. So what I like about the stuff on the right, the traditional list, which certainly we must take care of, but also the less traditional stuff on the left, is again some interesting passion points, some interesting opportunities to start a conversation, to attract someone, to get someone's attention based on the stuff that they care about. What that results then is in segmentation, right? And so as you think about the research that you'll do, the conversations you'll have, um, the gatherings that you'll go to, yeah, as you gather more and more information about the prospective targets, right? In the same way that our college coaches are saying that they've got to get out there and they've got to spend time to understand who they've got to recruit, we need to do the same thing if we're looking for new players, right? New families, right? And, and so that kind of research is going to allow us to understand which of these are most important in our communities, targeting the segments of families that we want to target. That gives you some kind of segmentation, and you might say there's three or four or five different segments yeah, of, of, um, of, of parents, of, of young people that you're targeting. And then you build a plan around each one of those. So you don't have a marketing plan that is for everyone. You have a marketing plan per segment, yeah, based on the stuff that matters to that segment based on the way that that segment wants to be communicated with. So let's look at some of those. You may have heard about a marketing funnel before, right? And it's basically this idea that we want to move people from not knowing that we exist all the way through to being loyal, 
Okay, and so we move through some kind of funnel. And most of the literature talks about top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. Cool, that's kind of simple. Uh, what's interesting about this is the kinds of marketing activities, communication, promotion, advertising, any kind of marketing activities, what kind of activities make the most sense at different points in the funnel? And again, you're mapping here your segments over the funnel. So some of the segments that you might be targeting, right? Those group of families over there that are looking for that kind of thing. They may be at the top of the funnel. They may not have considered you at all. They may be in the phase of discovery and awareness. Right? How do we get on their radar? How do we get them to know that we exist? No one's going to buy from you if they don't know who you are. Yeah? So they have to get awareness. It's not enough. Yeah, you know about a lot of brands. Do you buy a lot of brands? So there's a difference between awareness and purchase. But we've got to have awareness in order to get down that funnel towards purchase. Right? So top of the funnel stuff, which of your segments, which of your prospective families, young people, etc., cetera, um, are up here where they don't really know who you are. They've never thought about playing. They've never thought about clinics or camps or whatever it might be. Uh, and so what are some of the marketing activities here? Search engine optimization. Yeah, so how have we used some SEO skills, some basic search engine optimization, keywords um, to make sure that our websites, yeah, uh, including Facebook, uh, are most easily findable on Google? Right? So if, if someone searches, they will find you. Have you tried to search for yourself? Yeah, search for your club? Yeah, log out of everything so that the computer doesn't know it's you. Get rid of all those cookies. Right? And then, or find someone else's computer, and then try and search for your club. See how easy it is to find you. Because if parents can't easily find you, if young people in high school can't easily find you, they'll just go to the ones that they can. Yeah? We drink Coke and Pepsi because we know about Coke and Pepsi. Yeah? Coke and Pepsi spend most of their money to make sure that we remember who they are every single day. Yeah? How do you make sure that the people that you're targeting know who you are? Can they find you? So search engine optimization, really easy, simple stuff to do. You can pay people to do it. There's a lot of stuff you can do yourself. Yeah. Uh, paid earned media platforms. We're going to talk about paid owned and earned media platforms. Yeah. Paid is obviously your traditional advertising approach, including digital. So spending money on Facebook or spending money on Instagram or spending money in a newspaper, paid media, right? Um, and that's got to be part of our strategy if the owned media and the earned media, which is more free, if that's not working, you get what you pay for. Like most things in life, you get what you pay for. So if you're not investing any money in acquiring new families or players, well, your return on investment is zero. Yeah? because you're not spending anything. Yeah. So you've got to have a balance between paid, earned, and owned. And then community engagement, as I said. Consideration and evaluation, so more middle of the funnel. They know about you. They've heard about you. Uh, they know you're a club yeah, uh, in the area. Now they're going to start considering you. Yeah. Now relative to all the things they're going to do in a week, relative to all the other sporting and non-sporting activities, now they want to weigh up. Yeah. Is this something I, I actually want to do? Now you want to hit them with content marketing. So what kind of content are you creating? And when I say content, it's any text, uh, video, images that you are creating, storing, planning, and then using. Yeah? So that you're feeding into your channels. Typically, these are owned channels, like social media channels. Okay, so if I look at some of your Facebook pages, I looked at some of your Twitter pages over the last few days, I can see some stuff that you've put out there. Yeah? What I wonder about is what's the content marketing strategy behind that? Have you mapped the specific content to the kind of objective you want that content to achieve? So when you post something, what do you want to achieve? Is that post here? Are you posting something on Facebook in order to be discovered? Are you posting something on Facebook in order to get consideration? Are you posting something on Facebook in order to get conversion, to get someone to actually sign up? Yeah? Because that piece of content will be a little bit different depending on what your objective is. If 
you're just trying to raise awareness, it's about the name and the logo. Yeah? It's about content marketing. It's about the benefits. What are the benefits of playing for this club? What are all the things I can get from playing for this club? Uh, owned media platforms we spoke about, guides and catalogs. What is going across that household's dining room table? Do you know what pieces of paper, what emails are going across that household's dining room table? Think about your own dining room table. How many pieces of paper from school, from the city, from councils, recreational departments? How many pieces of paper is coming across your dining room table? And are you in those pieces of paper? My wife sits for a few days every year when it comes to, uh, kind of nowish time, thinking about summer, and she gets all these catalogs, right, from Lafayette and Moraga and all these kind of La Marinda spaces. She sits down and she goes through every single one. If you're not in there, she's not going to buy you. That's where she's looking. Now, if a buddy of hers told her about something and it's not in the catalog, she might, if she has time, she might go and look online. But someone's done all the effort to put these catalogs together and put it on the dining room table for us. That's what we're going to buy from. So we kind of think in a social media world that we throw catalogs out. And that's 1980s. Yeah? But think about what comes across your dining room table. Yeah? Think about the stuff that your prospective families and parents and young people are reading. Are you there? If you're not there, they're not going to see you. And if they don't already have a relationship with you, they're probably not going to buy you. So that's the investment we need to make. Yeah? And then public relations is all the stuff we're putting out in the media. Yeah? So newspapers, uh, magazines, blogs. Uh, what, what, what is being written about you? What is being said about you in the community, in your communities, that you are not saying about yourself? Which journalists are writing what kind of stories um, about the athletes and about the games and about your performances, etc.? Yeah? PR is a useful influencer uh, in this space as well. And then lastly, around conversion, reference groups. We mentioned parents, teachers, um, other sports clubs. Uh, do we engage with other coaches in other sports? Yeah. Um, if you're looking for a bunch of 10-year-olds and all those 10-year-olds are playing basketball, do we have a relationship with a basketball coach so that we can introduce soccer to them? Or do we not kind of cross that border. It's like there's a boundary there, right? Basketball and soccer. We, we, don't, we, we don't, right? Why not? Especially if it's uh, complementary, right? Complementary seasons or people moving out of one into the other. Uh, in some of the other work I do around rugby, anybody know rugby? Cool. Uh, you know, one of the... Like track and field. Uh -huh. Yeah, Soccer, right? exactly. Uh, so we've seen some of the, for example, the Eagles that won in Vegas yesterday. A uh, number of those athletes coming out of American football, coming out of track and field. Right? Is that a bad thing? No. It's about you know, people playing multiple sports. Uh, direct marketing. Do you have a list? Do you buy lists? Do you have a list of prospective families, of prospective young people? Yeah? How do we get access to those lists? Uh, how do we communicate in a very personalized and customized way to those people in a typical direct marketing? What's your CRM strategy? Right? Do you have a database? Do you have a database of prospective families and young people? Or do we have only a database of the people who've signed up? If a company only had a database of their customers, they would constantly be going out of business. Because every company needs to acquire as customers leave. Right? There's churn in every company. Every brand loses customers all the time. Every company would go out of business if they only worked for the people who are currently customers. They've constantly got to acquire. And that's our conversation this afternoon. What are you investing in the acquisition part? Not the current, not loyalty. Yeah? It's about acquisition. So where's your lists for acquisition? And that's what direct marketing would be about. And then events and gatherings, etc. We spoke about paid, earned, and owned. I've spoken a little bit about that. And here are your options at the top. These are just a few. How many of these are we using? But just a quick show of hands. Who's using Facebook as a way to acquire 
new families, new players. Okay, so Facebook kind of, okay, almost 30, 40%. Uh, Instagram, a few, few less. Twitter, okay. Uh, YouTube, YouTube, uh, one or two. Uh, the website, your own websites. Yeah, everyone got a, got a website, got some kind of web presence. Um, email, email marketing, direct marketing, lists, sending emails to prospectors. Yeah, um, some kind of offline advertising, banners at schools, banners at sports events, sports facilities. Yeah, don't forget, even though we're kind of in the social world, we're in this internet world, don't forget offline still matters. We've got to balance offline and online. Uh, some kind of news, PR, blogs, yeah? <clears throat> and then lastly, events. How are we using those? Yeah? So we talk about an integrated marketing communication strategy. The idea is you don't just use one thing. Use multiple platforms, multiple ways of engaging, and you do that at the same time with similar content. But what you put on Twitter can't be the same as what you put on Facebook, can't be the same as what you put on Instagram. Because those platforms are different. People go to those platforms for different things, right? What do you use Facebook for personally, individually? What do we use Facebook for? Just as users, just as Facebook users. What do you use Facebook for? Anyone use Facebook? <laughs> Only my wife? For information. Um, I think as adults, right, for drafting. Yeah, what do you use Facebook for? <laughs> Anything you publicly prepared to share with the room? <laughs> Just for purposes, really? You use Facebook for information? Yeah. You and I need to talk. <laughs> what do you use Facebook for? Yeah, buddies, friends, family. Okay, it's social. It's very social. Um, it's, about, it's about that kind of online community. So what kind of content would then be most appropriate to put into someone's feed if that's what they're using the platform for? It's not a newspaper for most people. For you, maybe. We need to have a conversation. Uh, but for most people, it's not a newspaper, right? It's not a TV. Yeah, although those videos are increasingly TV-like. So oh, website. yeah, there were lots of articles written around some recent political campaign we need to talk about. Anyway, uh, but understand what the platform is yeah, and how are we tweaking that content. What's great on Instagram? What do we use Instagram for? Who, who has a personal Instagram account? What do you use Instagram for? Pictures. You posting pictures? Okay. And what kind of pictures do you look at that you want to share with us in the room? Really? Family, friends on Instagram? <laughs> Memes. Memes. Funny stuff. Funny stuff. Yeah. Instagram is entertainment. It's distractions. Yeah. It's got to be interesting. It's got to be engaging. It's got to get my attention. It can't be heavy on text. It's all about pictures. It's all about short videos. Um, it's, you know, it, it's something I'm just going to go through um, in my spare time, and it's got to keep me engaged. I don't want to pay attention. I don't want to read stuff. Yeah? Whereas on Twitter, it's very different, right? What do we use Twitter for? That should be more information. Yeah? All right, so Twitter is about now. It's about immediacy. It's about what's happening right now, or what are the conversations happening right now, yeah? And and so it's it's, it's much more about current updates, current information, uh, a little bit more heavy on text. Yeah? So can you see every platform is different? Yeah? What you put in the Wall Street Journal is not the same as what you put in the New York Times. Different readers. Yeah? So sometimes we think about social media as one thing. Yeah? Um, I don't have a clock in front of me, so I'm just going to double check here. Right, and we are almost done. Good. Uh, so what do I want to highlight? I'm going to skip some of these points. I want to just talk a little bit about Facebook. Uh, because Facebook is a big part of what many of you do, um, as we said. So I just did a quick look this afternoon. Um, and how many of you are spending money in Facebook as part of your promotion? Cool. So you know about some of the insights that you can gather? right, around who is in Facebook and how you can access them. So just for example, here in Concord, okay, if I put in parents of a child six to eight years old, uh, there's one to one and a half thousand active users every week, yeah, right now that I can target, 
yeah, through an advert of some kind. And there's a myriad different ways now in which you can advertise on all of these different platforms. I'll just give a quick example of Facebook. You can see some information here. This is just easy information you can pull up this afternoon without a big account or without spending money. You can see gender, relationship status, education level. These are the things that I thought were really interesting. Right? What are these people doing? Right? So the top categories for searching and spending time right, is baby and children's clothing stores. It's the Martinez Farms, uh, some coffee shop, media, toy shop, ice cream shop. This is what people are doing on Facebook, those one to one and a half thousand people who have kids between the age of six to eight in Concord right now. This is what they're doing. Yeah? And so if we want to reach those people, that's where we've got to be. That's the kind of content we've got to be engaging with. If we're going to do an offline banner, that's where we've got to do the offline banner. Yeah? If we're going to put a piece of advertising, those are the pages we should put that advertising in. Yeah, because this is stuff that people care about. This is what they're doing in Facebook. Um, page likes, similar kind of stuff. Uh, children's retail store, obviously school, the farm, families. Yeah, you can think about six to eight-year-old kids. Yeah, and you can do this, obviously, for every demographic that you may be targeting, obviously, in every geography. Yeah, so how are we using these in some way? Hi, my name Skip that. Uh, last few comments just about um, sending out the message, right? So we said who... We said why, uh, and we said um, where they are and how we're going to communicate with them. Uh, so I spoke earlier about direct marketing, and personalization is a big issue in direct marketing. How many of you like getting a letter from your bank that says, dear valued customer? Anybody? No, we don't like getting a letter that says, dear valued customer, because if they got our name right on the outside of the letter, so that it arrived at our house, why can't they get our name right on the inside of the letter? That's just pathetic, right? They should be shot. Right? That's bad marketing. Okay? So we can't say, dear valued family, dear parents. Yeah? Basic mail merge, basic email mail merge, basic letter mail merge, so that you can personalize what you're sending. Uh, and you can see this is a, a recent study from Salesforce, marketers using personalization increasingly. Um, I, I increasingly think that uh, non-personalized, non-customized content is increasingly going to be seen as wallpaper, it's going to be seen as noise, and people are just going to ignore it because it doesn't talk to them. So personalization and customization. Personalization is easy. We have the person's name. Let's use it. Is it a little bit harder? Sure. Does it take longer? Sure. Do we have to get our heads around some basic CRM systems that are freely available online? Sure. Uh, we can't just do dear parent and send it to a thousand people. It's going to take a little bit longer. But do you want those thousand emails to be effective or not? Yeah? And the balance between efficiency and effectiveness, I would err on the effectiveness. Okay. And then lastly, what are the technologies that you're using? Yeah? Um, do, do you have a basic thing like a spreadsheet? What's your planning system? Yeah? Do you have a database? Do you have some of these kinds of of, of technologies, um, and many of these are freely available. Yeah, so you don't need to spend money on the technology. What you do need to do is spend a little bit of time to make sure that the, that the database is updated, that you've got that information, and it's an ongoing day-by-day -day weekly process because it's the business of sport. Yeah? And, and I, I think what's interesting about this afternoon session is it's about an investment in the business and the organization of sport, not just what happens on the field. Yeah, because you can be match winning on the field, but the rest of the organization kind of falls apart around you, right? You got to have both of those sorted, uh, and certainly our focus is very much on on the off the field stuff, right? The organization, and that's about the investment every day, yeah, in building that organization and thinking about your current and your future customers. Cool. I hope that was useful. There's a bit more information in those slides we didn't have a chance to go through. We're kind of heading towards the end of time. So are there any questions that we haven't been able to address? Questions? Where is this going to be available next? So there's the club, um, the club development section of our website. So all of the different seminars that we put on, um, presentations, that kind of stuff, and even examples of 
different club operations work is all housed in there, categorized, that kind of thing. So we'll be uploading it shortly. Any other quick questions? Otherwise, I'll be around for a bit. Cool. Big round of applause. Oh. Thank you to Professor Goldman. Yeah.